Yeah, so uh, my name's Mike Wagens. I am the CEO of Shift5, a uh, startup out of Roslyn, Virginia, where we secure planes, trains, and automobiles, or tanks, actually, is normally <laughs> what we, uh, we shift into that last word there. Um, let's see, I graduated from West Point in 2011, and I was really fortunate. While I was there, I studied computer science. And uh, the Army, uh, back a couple of years ago, you know, was really kind of looking forward, uh, you know, toward... Uh, uh, towards cyber and computer network operations, computer security. And so uh, studying computer science at the academy, they uh, offered me a, a bunch of summer internship opportunities, which exposed me uh, to DARPA, to the Naval Research Lab, iRobot. Uh, I worked at the Institute for Creative Technologies um, out in Marina Del Rey, California. And it was through those internships that I was actually, uh, you know, came in direct contact with the hacking community. And uh, I made a couple friends along the way. Um, and some of them encouraged me uh, to take, at the time, my love of UAVs and model airplanes and, uh, and just, you know, see if I could get a talk into, uh, you know, ShmooCon and DEF CON, which I was fortunate enough to do before I graduated. Um, so, you know, pretty early on, I, I kind of identified with the hacker community. Um, and I really liked, I don't know, just there was something sexy about it, right? And so it, it really drew me in. And then, of course, I graduated and they commissioned me as an infantry officer because that's what you do with a computer science degree. <laughs> yep. Same thing to me. Don't worry. So, uh, you know, I go to Fort Benning after a little stint at uh, Fort Belvoir where I got a little taste of cyber. You know, they get you excited and then they send you to Fort Benning. And I went to infantry school and uh, it was exciting, you know, being like uh, a full fledged nerd and, and showing up and not having a lifted truck and, uh, you know, just like working out all day and learning to shoot guns and stuff. So I finish infantry school and they send me to ranger school and airborne school and I kind of do the whole program down there. And then they ship me off to uh, Fort Hood, Texas, where I uh, served as a platoon leader um, in a uh, what they call a combined arms unit. So we had these uh, giant vehicles that kind of look like tanks called Bradleys. And uh, we were we were in a heavy unit. It was, you know, it was really exciting. Semi heavy. Semi, well, I was in a paladin unit. That's oh, heavy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, you know, it was cool because we got to go out to the range and, and shoot stuff and blow things up all day. And I got to learn, you know, what it's like to, uh, you know, to lead and manage like, you know, 40 uh, guys from across the country. Uh, did a couple of overseas stints and everything with that outfit. And then uh, the Army in 2014 established the cyber branch. And I was like, oh, man, this is my chance. Like I, I can finally get back to just nerding out full time. So uh, I was picked up in the first kind of wave of like 60 officers that came into the branch. Um and eventually, I found my way uh, up to Fort Meade, where I was, you know, working for Army Cyber Command, and uh, you know, there I just had this incredible opportunity to, you know, to work kind of all across the Department of Defense and uh, in the the federal government more broadly. Um, and uh, you know, I just got a lot of experience with operational technology. You know the you know, the, the types of network technologies that underpin all of our transportation systems. Uh, I found that I really liked that because I had always had an interest in microelectronics and microcontrollers. Um, I was a decent programmer, but by no means the best. And, uh, and I, I didn't really find that reverse engineering binaries was my expertise. And so I gravitated more toward the tech that ran on like slower processors and these old like serial data buses, which it turns out like our entire society is underpinned by. So after, you know, just being exposed to these critical vulnerabilities for, you know, years um, in the federal government, as we were trying to patch our own stuff and stay one step ahead of the adversary, um, I decided to jump out so that I could found a company with a couple of my tremendously talented coworkers, James Kareni and Josh Lospinoso, uh, Guy Filippelli. Uh, we wanted to bring a company together where we could, you know, frankly, solve these problems, you know, uh, help protect planes, trains, and tanks where we could, you know, from cyber attack. Nice. Awesome. Um, so great. Let's see. Um, so kind of, you said that like you, inter uh, you said that you, um, you kind of got interested in doing these, uh, AIADs is what they're called at the Academy, but the, the summer, the summer internships, um, what kind of made you wanted to go, like what caused you to go into computer science? The first, like yeah, in the first so, place, like, you know, the funny story is I didn't even get into West Point the first time that I applied. I, I was from Maryland, which is a really competitive region. And I applied and they rejected me and I didn't accept no for an answer. I kept driving up to the academy and uh, like literally sitting outside the door of the regional admissions officer until one day he, I think he just broke down. He was like, all right, listen, <laughs> 
here's the deal, son. You know, you can uh, you can go to like one of these four like prep schools. Of course, I picked this one. Which one? Called the New Mexico Military Institute High in five. Roswell. Yeah, Roswell, New Mexico. So uh, fun fact, I went there because I was a, an AOG prep. Get out. Uh, Tommy's brother went to NIMI no as an early commissioning program grad. Yeah. Um, so Actually, it's an interesting, as we're talking about background ties, fun fact, I was actually born on Fort Hood. Get out. Uh, yeah, my dad was an 18 Bravo. No kidding. Yeah, so it's a small world, right? Yeah, you can't. Uh, you you guys at home can't see this podcast, but it is a complete bromance moment in this room right now. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So you know, Team I spent building. a year out out in Roswell, New Mexico, which, without a car, without a car, <laughs> yes, uh, without any money, right? As well, uh, there was this uh, like restaurant across the street called Farley's, Farley's and yeah. you know, I'd like scrape together a couple pennies and go over there get fries like once a month, but. Uh, Great time. Uh, learned a lot about what the Southwest is like, you know, culturally. It's beautiful out there. Um, there's a lot of really smart people in Albuquerque, by the way. Just really, really yeah. incredible corner of the country. Where's like at that huge NASA, the new, uh, whole like, there's a whole like there's NASA like launch facility. Yeah, now, there's right? a whole launch facility out there. And like, oh, wow. there's a lot of like super smart. So, like, my uncle, um, he used to work out there and he managed like crazy supercomputers and like building those things back in like the seventies and the eighties. And so there's just a lot of smart people that still just live out there. Yeah. It's nuts. You've got the national labs. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a ton of space. So if you like the outdoors, um, a little bit of everything, right? So, uh, you know, so I go to NIMI, I do my year there and then, uh, I, I finally make my way to West Point. And while I was at NIMI, you know, after, I don't know, a couple months, I, I started to get bored. And so I went to Walmart which is like the only store in Roswell at the time. And it was like three miles away. So yeah. you had to catch the bus. Uh, I, I walked, oh. like literally. I was, <laughs> I was super poor. And um, I buy this little control line car. Do you guys remember before the days of RC cars, the controller was connected with a cable? Oh yeah, to the electric the electric track. Uh, no, no, not like that. Like this was a, like a, this was like a four wheeler car that you could like take out into the parking lot, but the controller still had a cord connected oh. <laughs> from, uh, so this thing, when, I, when was this out of curiosity? This was probably like 2008. So this okay. was only like 25 bucks. This is probably the only toy, you know, that I, could <laughs> for. I, I bought this thing and I had, um, I had a parallax basic stamp. If any of that rings a bell. Yep. Before Arduino, in a time, you know, before microcontrollers were easy to program, there was one company called Parallax, and they had this Parallax basic stamp. And I had taken this thing, and I had a, a little Etrex Garmin GPS that transmits GPS information on these serial lines on the outside. And I had kind of, like, glued everything together so that this car would, um, would attempt to drive a route that you would program into the GPS. I didn't know anything about control theory, so it was like yep. a bang bang controller. It was <laughs> terrible. If if somebody had been exposed to this car as like this is what autonomy might look like one day, they'd be terrified, you know. Yeah. Um so you know, I had done this uh this kind of project on the side at NIMI and uh, when I got got to West Point, I you know, I wasn't smart enough to like um test out of any of the courses that I had no. literally just taken the year before. This, it was the exact same course, same books, same everything. So I'm repeating a bunch of the same coursework my freshman year at West Point, and I end up uh, just getting really bored within a couple weeks. So there I am on like this main street uh, called Thayer Road uh, at West Point, and I, I get my little car out and I'm playing with it in this like army colonel, which is really terrifying experience. They have like uh, what look like uh, chickens or yeah. you know, to my mom, but they're like <laughs> eagles, right? Yeah. On his shoulder, really high ranking officer. He just like walks up to me and is like, good up. What are you doing? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> which is the most po terrifying possible question you can get from a colonel. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I don't know, 17, 18 years old at this point, <laughs> and I'm just speechless because nobody has ever, you know, no colonels ever stopped to talk to me before. And um, he's like, what, what is this? You know, and I'm like, oh, this is just my like personal project. And he's like, this isn't for class. I'm like, no, it's my personal project. And he's like, who are you? You know, apparently it turns out that this project kind of looked like a project that you did at the end of this mechatronics class that yep. like juniors and seniors Junior would take. Yeah, I did it. And, uh, except ours had whiskers and could feel the wall and then they'd learn, they would oh, learn that's the room. Cool. So, so anyways, the next day, you know, he, I like report to his office. Right. And, uh, and he introduces me to a couple other guys that I subsequently end up working with like years later, um, in the army, you know, in the cyber community. And they just started giving me access to equipment, you know, like here's an Arduino and like, here's a, 
you know, like a ping sensor, you know, one of these ultrasonic sensors and stuff. And so I started like pimping out this uh, little RC car. I had upgraded it by, by putting motors in that I had ripped out of some, somebody's printer that they had uh, like tossed out. Out of window. In the trash, probably out yeah. of a window. There was like a riot at one point at yeah. the academy. Yeah, it was pretty, it was a pretty exciting day. <laughs> so you could like pick up printer parts in the, in the, co- in the, like the quad. And, uh, so I was putting all my time in this car and then of course my grades start to tank cause I'm just not being challenged and, uh, and I get yelled at, but it was through those experiences that the faculty kind of, uh, you know, to their credit, there's a lot of interaction between the faculty and the cadets at the service academies cause there's such a small, mm-hmm. um, you know, student to, uh, to instructor ratio. And so they offered up these really exciting summer internship opportunities through a program called AIAD, um, and I did four of them, which I'm pretty sure is uh, is not possible now. Like they only <laughs> let you do one, but I, I got the opportunity to uh, to intern at almost every corner of the military industrial complex. I even spent a little bit of time on the hill, um, and it was really kind of exciting to see technology on the DoD side from uh, private industry, from a contractor, from the government, you know, procurement side, from government R and D. I was exposed to all that before, like I could even drink. It was really cool. So I was set up for failure, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's, it's weird. Like we're basically spirit animals right now because um, I had a very, very, very similar experience where I took all the classes at NIMI, get to West Point, and I'm just taking the same classes because I didn't test out because you had to carry like a B or an A average yep. at NIMI in order to even have the conversation the about testing to test out. out. Yeah. And so I just got super bored. I was sitting in the mess hall. And somebody threw up a slide uh, asking if you liked programming and like possibly working with the special forces and all this other kind of crazy stuff. So I emailed whatever, whoever it was, um, and found out that they were running a network science thing. So network science was like the new hip term back then. Um, They had not stood up the network science center at West Point yet, but they, they just stood it up. And so I started like basically hacking um, like, do you guys remember those little tiny Sony Vio PCs? I like do. Like a little slider. Little, like micro like, PC style. It was like yeah, a yeah. full PC though. It ran Windows mm-hmm. XP or NT. I think it, I think it was NT, NT or 2000. Yeah, this It'd was pre triple E PC. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys remember those? Yes. Oh my God. I took one on an AID to Thailand. Get out. Yeah. It was the greatest thing. I thought it was so cool. And now I couldn't even imagine using that. It's like <laughs> a Raspberry Pi blows us away. Yeah. Yeah. Tight, yeah. Um, and so I started developing these tools. They were using natural language processing to like analyze text. And so I was just basically writing all these scripts to kind of tie it together and upload it like in a relatively fast fashion. So like you take a photo and then three minutes later you would know kind of the thematic intent of this like product. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's how I got hooked as like a freshman, um, and that's how I started getting introduced to like Josh Lospinoso and all those people because he was just writing papers and they were like trying to like get us to do some stuff. Uh, they were doing like a lot of the BlackBerry stuff. Um, but so that's kind of how I got hooked and then started committing. Because like when I first got to West Point, like it was questionable if I was going to go like mechanical engineering or IT or computer science and things like that. And so I eventually just went IT so that I had more time to work on some of these like side projects uh, for for fun. And so it was super interesting. That's kind of how I, I got stuck into that whole like area. I, I found that generally speaking, like people who got into programming stumbled, like even I, I stumbled into it myself in JCAC, they have one programming class and it's programming. They teach you Perl, Python mm. and C supposedly in four and a half days. That's, that's, <laughs> wow. the, that's what the class purports to do. Now at the end of that class on average, no one can write any program, but I, I, any code, I fell in love with it. And so I ended up taking, you know, I took that class and the instructor of that class, uh, whose name I won't say on the air because I don't know if he'd be cool with that, actually got me my first uh, post at Navy Cyber Warfare Development Group because he had just left there being a programmer, quit mm-hmm. the Navy, and become an instructor to teach young programmers. So he got me my first job over at Nickwidge, and I just started basically building tools. And they're like, yeah, they're like five programmers in the Navy, and now you're number six. So good luck. Get to work. <laughs> um, and it was one of those where just, yeah, it, it seems like in that, one of the great things about that mili- military education process is you were talking about the faculty to studi- student ratio mm-hmm. is so low. And so the faculty are able to get much more involved if, if they choose to are able to get much more involved in the, the progression of their students and open doors that they would just never have otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah, it was crazy. And they, they like just built this lab. And mm-hmm. so they were just like, oh, you've now like proven yourself to like use this lab. The Thayer 212 lab. Yeah, the Thayer 212 oh, lab. This because is it was famous. Yeah. It was right when like VMware became like ESX was still 
like I guess it's always been open source, but mm -hmm. like it was it was still only the free stuff. Yeah. And they would like show me how you could just destroy a server and bring it back up. And like they were just <laughs> like, here's a console to go and do whatever you want. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Oh, that original, that immediate discovery of the concept of ephemerality. Oh, is yeah. Just it was great. I immediately <laughs> took it and installed it in my parents' house. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, you know, you could bypass certain firewalls for certain things because you needed a, you point. know, that. That specific room uh, in this decrepit old building called Thayer Hall that used to be literally like a stable. I mean, yeah. they they kept horses in it. They converted it to classrooms decades ago. There's a specific room in there called Thayer 212 where like they run these war exercises, right? And I swear if you're like a cadet and you do one of these NSA cyber defense exercises, it's evolved a little bit in recent years, but you get a taste for, you know, what it's like to do real, you know, cyber defense, cyber offense, um, you know, to, to be yeah. part of something operational. It's exciting. Once you get a taste for it, you know, you're almost ruined. Like, yeah. you can't oh, do yeah. anything oh, yeah. You're just, you're useless in any other field. After I that. was upset because I think I was the last year where they didn't let us do offense. And so back in the day, you just had to sit there and defend boxes. And I was defending, I think, an Active Directory server, a Postfix server, um, in DNS. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I got so bored like the first day in cause there's, there's things you can do to lock it down that like, I know they're not going to get in. Cause I mean, we're cadets or I was a cadet. Like they're not going to use a zero day exploit. Yeah. On they're me. not so, like, no one's just, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> too worried. And it was back, you know, since it's active directory, you can change every setting in the book to yeah. lock it down. And we turned on the firewall. So we only whitelisted the sources of traffic we saw because you have like a week lead up and we are like, okay, cool. Let's turn it on full and then just open one by one. Um, but yeah, it's, it was nuts. And the, the, the offense, I think the next year was, I would have been like completely sold. So, you know, one of the really kind of cool things about uh, this educational uh, experience that we had mm -hmm. was that that specific room was kind of home to uh, not this click, but like this group of people that were all studying together, were all living together in the barracks. Like you can't really leave on the weekends at a service academy. It's a pretty, uh, it's kind of an austere, yeah. uh, you know, educational experience. I, I wouldn't, I would not call it college. No. It's not college. But you go there and you form these friendships and you learn from one another. And when you get a good group going like that, what's really cool is that everybody ends up joining the army together, right? And you almost end up like in the, in similar branches or the same branches. And you end up living with these guys later when you post to the same place mm -hmm. together. You end up going to war with these guys. And you, f you form these relationships and these bonds that are inex you know just inexplainable unless you had gone through it and i think of that particular room as the place that that really inspires people to get in and do something uh, meaningful and impactful in this field and, oh, and yeah. where incredible relationships are 100% forged. i would i would argue that most of probably the most impactful people at cyber command in the last couple of years at least junior officers started in 212 oh, oh no true. doubt yeah like 100% i just, didn't even go and i can tell you offhand i've heard this conversation between yeah. every like Intel officer I've ever met and respected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. But then in the army, it's full glory sent me to be a logistician because why would they waste all this money? So I I'm told that they've gotten a lot better at this, right? Yeah. It, okay. But only in recent years. Sure. So. Sure. I'll, I'll believe it when, <laughs> when yeah. I see proof of this in the, no, the military world. has always gotten a lot better as soon as you leave and people are trying to get you back. Right, all of a right. sudden it improves dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So what's a, uh, what's a, uh, what's one thing you would change? Like as you enter your career into cyber, um, I know you guys both, both kind of in the military type thing, but like what's one thing you would have changed or like told your younger self to do differently if you were just getting in. So I'm talking post-schooling, but like in the military as you hit like your first duty station. I would say probably the very first thing I would tell myself is to learn how to pace yourself. Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges that people get in this, we talk about like it's addictive when you get into this field. Um, very commonly you'll see people put in a 12 hour day and then go home and work on the same project for another six hours. And that's not a bad thing. Like being passionate about your work is good, but learning how to take a project and really think long term, like, is this, you know, how do I do this effectively? How do I use my time well and keep learning? I think is a big deal. Um, just being able to pace yourself in general is, is one of the skill sets that I think cyber professionals, you didn't see me do the air quotes, but cyber professionals, uh, tend to not be great at that. And it's one of the more important skill sets. So, you know, what I would say is that uh, when you get started in this field, 
there's this uh, feeling that you're inadequate. And in psychology, they mm -hmm. call it the imposter syndrome. And I think it's just really important to realize that everybody starts out from zero, no matter where you are. Like at some age, at some point, you figured out, hey, this is interesting, and uh, or I wanna do this for some reason, mm -hmm. and, and you're starting out from zero. You don't know how to code. You know, Maybe you learned to code in middle school or high school or college or later in life, um, but at some point you didn't know anything. And I think it's really important to realize that uh, you know, a lot of experts in the field are uh, extremely, uh, their expertise is very narrow. There are a lot of people as well that can couple that with a lot of breath, but there's nobody that knows everything. Right. And so uh, what's really cool about the field is the way that it evolves so quickly. You can find a niche area of the field and own it 100%. and truly Absolutely. own it and make it yours. And it, it won't take too long to get there, you know, just a couple years. But if, if you stick to it and you keep the imposter syndrome at bay and you just tell yourself, like, I want to make a name for myself, you can go out there and do it. And then I think, you know, the question is like, do I, you know, obviously I would advocate for doing that in a socially responsible way. I, I think I, I did that, but I, I watched some other people um, that I kind of came up with uh, that I think made, uh, you know, poor decisions along the way. And, um, and so I would just say, you know, imposter syndrome, uh, you know, having some moral and ethical understanding of like what you're doing as you go about your work with an eye to the future and what you could accomplish is really important. Um, and so I guess just, just turning it all back, you know, I was really intimidated when I got started mm -hmm. and I should have realized that I shouldn't have been, and I should have just openly acknowledged like, you know, Hey, I'm a noob. Um, is that, is anybody willing to, you know, help me figure mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z out? Oh, yeah. I find people are super gracious as long as you don't come in and peacock. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're willing to admit a lack of knowledge, one of the great things about this field is someone is willing to give you that information. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to your point about, you know, um, specializing and understanding that you can own a niche because I think people tend to not really get the, the extent to which that's true, you know. And, and I often like when I'm talking to new uh, cybersecurity professionals or just IT professionals, I try to hammer home the idea of like when you're going through elementary and high school, you're just learning a little bit about everything, just how the world works, math, everything. Then you go to college, you pick something that you get, you know, this is what you specialize in. This is a general area of knowledge in which you're considered knowledgeable. Then you go for your master's degree and there's a subfield in that that you get really good at. Then you go for your PhD and there is one thing you know everything about and just you have no more information. So my personal example for this is that in most conversations, I describe myself as a Windows specialist. My real specialty is undocumented network driver functions on Windows kernels. Wow. That's that's the narrow level that you're going to. It's mm -hmm. not an operating system. It's not a technique. It's very specific skill sets. That's a small. That's a small club you can have a conversation about. Exactly. With, right? How many people do you think you could have a conversation about that with? I know all of their first names. Yeah. <laughs> Which is another really, I think, exciting thing about this field is that you know through Slack, through discourse, uh, you know if you you know if you're really old school IRC, right? And yeah. there's a bunch of IRC boards still around. So what are you talking about the? The army still uses IRC like it's oh. not his business. <laughs> Mer what? Merck? Merck. Merck chat. Merck was the, I think I used Merck before I was in the army anyway. Yeah. Not to be confused with BFT, all those same user experience. Yeah. yeah. There was yeah. a point at a Navy command where they locked down every communication, like to include Gmail. You couldn't get on Gmail at work. Mm -hmm. IRC was still available. Oh, 100%. Like <laughs> every time. That's, that's what they run on. <laughs> and I, I remember like I had to give people classes because mm -hmm. I knew all the commands back from, you know, when you used to be able to share files and yeah. all those kind of slap things folks with work. fish. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Um, so yeah, we're going to, so I, I just think that like in the age where communication is so ubiquitous, like, mm -hmm. you know, these communities exist, get on Reddit, find that sub community, right? Like go, go to a local hacker conference, like a B sides, find mm -hmm. somebody and just be like, yo, how do you like communicate with other people yeah. that are interested in the same stuff? And then boom. Right. Yeah. There's probably a ton of Discord channels now and yeah, all just crazy stuff. You just have to look. Show up to a bar with something hacky in its name. Like there are just so many ways to do it. Cool. Let's talk about uh let's talk about your favorite tool, offensive, defensive. Who wants to go first? I went first on the what would you advise your younger self for? So you're up. So I, I would have to say Kismet. Um and the reason for that <laughs> is that uh, Dragorn actually came. So describe Kismet in your own words first. Kismet is like the Swiss Army knife of okay. Wi-Fi hacking, right? Um, and, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so Dragorn, like the author, right. You know, he comes to, uh, he comes to school one day and he gives this like over lunch, you know, presentation on, on some research that he's doing. And I was just like, wow, like here's a, here's a guy that's like made it right. He's made a tool that's known by everybody. Like, 
the world over, you know, is repackaged and sold, you know, yep. in certain corners of the world. But like, I mean, this is the expert that like wrote all the code and I was, I was, you know, I was just kind of like, wow, this is, this is cool. You yeah. know? Um, and, uh, he took I, all that knowledge and he spent the time to like package it so that he could give it to other people it, to yeah. like share it with the world, which is not such always a, such an altruistic, yeah. um, you know, trait. And I was really, uh, kind of enamored by that, uh, to be honest. And so what I wanted to do is at the time, uh, I wanted to put this on a little model airplane. Um, and the, this autopilot that was based on the Arduino was just out called Ardu pilot. Um, and this was uh, before you had, you know, quadcopters that were really reliable. You oh, could yeah. buy any of those on the market. Um, and I actually did a little uh, senior design project where I took Kismet. I put it on a. Uh, I think I read this paper. Board. Yeah, um, it was super exciting. So you know, I had basically this like war flying model airplane. A couple other people did it too, but uh, I, I loved that. It was so much fun. Yeah, that was like that was about the time I remember. I remember. Because you graduated in 2011. 11. Okay. So like my junior year, or I guess sophomore, it was all about the, the blue snarfing and the, uh, the directional cannons. And I was like, if only I could have something that just flies around and captures these. Because it was always somebody driving around in the van trying to capture all these things. And I was like, if I could just fly something. Back in 2010, 2011, it was actually pretty tricky to get like a model airplane or, or like a home-built quadcopter to, uh, you know, just with like hobbyist funds yeah. to mm -hmm. fly itself autonomously and not crash like uh, every like third or fourth flight. Um, there were a couple groups that were doing an amazing job. There was a team called Paparazzi out of Europe. Um, I know Jordi Munoz, um, you know, was uh, was taking over the Ardu pilot thing. That evolved into a company called 3D Robotics. Mm -hmm. Um, which was doing well, uh, but I, I think they've uh, since closed up shop because uh, DJI. DJI is crushing it. Yeah, they crushed it. I owned one of their first generations, and the, the whole board was open sourced, and you could do whatever you wanted. And I was just like, this is phenomenal. Because the sensors that came on it for the price, mm -hmm. I think the price was kind of expensive, but not compared to things up to that point. I think it was like $1,000 mm -hmm. for the first, second generation uh, Phantom. And you could use all the sensor data, like if it was dumping it to standard out, you could just. Yeah, great products from them, but uh, I don't know, I have concerns about my like data privacy. Personally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now that it phones home before you take off. Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, I'll have to say Ghidra. Uh, so, so Ghidra, for those of you who don't know, is a recently open source reverse engineering tool from the NSA. Uh, it is a godsend. It's it's almost indescribable how much better it is than any other alternative. I'm I, you know I, I being an exploit developer, being a vulnerability analyst, a huge chunk of your job is is reverse engineering tools and reverse engineering systems to figure out where the exploit can be found. Uh, and and I'm barely more than a mediocre reverse engineer. I it's not really what I'm good at. And fortunately, Gitter just does all of the work for me. It's this incredible tool, and it was developed. What was great is it's developed by reverse engineers who were basically just given, you know, a big chunk of time and a huge chunk of money, and just told, "Go forth and do something magical." Uh, and so it's it's one of these tools that you're getting reverse. You know, it's not just giving you just the the, you know, the tables or the exports imports. It's building out C plus plus code that you can very nearly compile and rerun. Like it's incredibly effective. A uh, really useful tool, a great collaborative tool. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Joe, how does it compare, in your opinion, to Binary Ninja or Ida? No competition. Ghidra, Ghidra, I love Ida, and I don't want to talk smack about it, but Ghidra just blows it out of the water every day. Nice. Um, mine, I'm going old school. Okay. So there was, I'd say it's probably two. So Sub7 was probably my first favorite. I don't know if you can consider it a hacking tool. Um, what is this, like 2003, 2002? It was like one of the first like Trojan horse things per se. I think it's sub seven. I'm almost positive it's sub seven. Uh, so you could basically send, it would, it was back in the AIM days. So you could like mm -hmm. send a link to your buddy. He'd click it and it would open a TCP connection, a uh, windsocket uh, to your computer. And then you could inject a CD-ROM drive. Over a, a dial-up modem probably. Yes. <laughs> and you could you could flip his screen. Yeah, yeah, you could do it. a bunch of things. And it, it started, it was kind of the first thing I got when I was in high school, like early high school that kind of started me going, taking computer science classes and things like that. Uh, it was just like, it was crazy at the time, like what it did and how it worked. I was just like fascinated by it. Um, and then second, another old school tool was Ethereal. 
um, that they later rebranded to Wireshark. Mm-hmm. That life changing. It was life changing yeah. just oh. because I could see everything that was happening, and I think it set me up uh, for kind of the rest of the next like 10, 20 years as I know what I'm looking at when I'm, I can, I can look at large blocks of data. Yeah, all these abstract concepts like just laid out in a yeah. timeline, right? And it was great. And you're yeah, just, being able to reconstruct streams, yeah. like that functionality by itself makes Wireshark incredibly useful. It's yeah. a great tool. It was great. So that's, that's what I like. Um, any any hackathon projects that you kind of do on the weekends that you want to talk about, share, anything cool? Uh, I mean, I'm working on, actually, it started out as a personal project and it's since become a cyber project, but uh, I, I'm a huge lover, obviously, you know, malware is, is my area of specialty, and I've got really interested in the ML revolution as it's, as it's picked up steam. Um, and I, it is kind of fascinating as a slight tangent that we talk about this new machine learning models and all the math we're using was developed in the 80s. Like, everyone knew how to do this. They just didn't have an expensive enough machine. But um, so I got really into that. So between those two, I've been working on um, it, it's got a whole long fancy name, but essentially a polymorphic engine powered by machine learning, uh, specifically focused on using for a data set. We're using functions from existing malware um, and functions from you know malware that that you can find on, on open source databases online. That sort of thing. Uh, and so we're, what we're doing is constructing shells for those functions and then running them against a big pile, you know, like a virus total kind of a big pile of AV PSP products. PSP products, anyway, um, and figuring out you know what catches, what doesn't catch, and how you know which machines are, are actually getting detections on it. So from that, we're able to construct this this machine learning model that we're still in the process of building out a lot of this data set. But um, it it takes a a piece of functionality that it has labels of you know what this what this specific function does, what it's for, inputs, outputs, that sort of thing, and constructs a new version of the malware binary for the given tool that it's targeting. So it sends out an an exploring bot says, okay, this is the PSP here. Whether or not that bot gets caught, we don't really care. Um, and then the malware is constructed autonomously to specifically avoid that instance of that malware. So that's my current project. Oh, nice. That's exciting. It's yeah. fun. It's a lot so of math. I have to admit, uh, you know, about six months ago, I like sat down um, with the lawyers because I was in the army and I got permission to, you know, like start this uh, nights and weekends, you know, side project, uh, Shift 5, uh, the company. And, uh, and then all my projects went out the window, and then oh, yeah. the, the project just became like build the product. Yeah. yeah. So talk about Shift Five then. Yeah, a CEO yeah. with hobbies frightens me, so right, I totally right. get yeah. it. <laughs> frightens you as an investor. <laughs> so all my investors, I only do Shift Five. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, so so Shift Five. You know what what I learned during my days in uh, you know in Army Cyber Command and U.S. Cyber Command was that uh, we have all this operational technology, right? Mm-hmm. Tanks. Planes, trains, helicopters—you know everything that uh, you know. Everything that I'm saying kind of sounds um, uh, transportation related, but it's so much more than that. There's so much uh, tech around us that's underpinned not by TCP/IP, mm-hmm. but by redundant serial data buses. And I'm not talking about serial. I'm talking about protocols like here's some obscure stuff for you. All right, so just prepare yourself. Right. Mill standard 1553. This is the thing that the International Space Station runs on. Yeah. Um, you know, A rank for 45 year old protocol. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it was originally developed by the DOD yeah. uh, for, you know, programs like the F 16, and it was adapted and, you know, put in like a, a bunch of our ground vehicles. And yeah. Now it's used by satellites. Super redundant. Um, just, just works. Maximum throughput of a megabit per second. Uh, but it was developed, you know, in an era where people just assumed, well, as long as it's not networked, it's secure, right? Yeah. Because the air gap solves all. Um, as, as we all know. <laughs> totally safe. <laughs> totally safe. So, um, you know, uh, there's some similar protocols in the aviation world uh, that were designed by a company called A Rank, uh, for A Rank 429, A Rank 717. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, a lot of people are familiar with the CAN bus, CAN 2.0. It's in your car. Uh, there's a, uh, a version of it that's in all the trucks and off road vehicles called J1939, where they implemented a version of the OSI stack essentially on the CAN 2.0. Uh, you know, like wireline standard. And so, you know, all of this stuff exists out there interconnecting these different electronic control units and it's just not secure. There's no authentication, there's no encryption. I, I think this is pretty well understood at this point. Um, you know, there's a 60 Minutes report uh, by Chris and, and Charlie a couple of years ago where they hacked a Jeep Grand Cherokee and, uh, you know, then like even my grandmother like understood like, oh, my my car can be hacked, right? So, um, <laughs> You know, and the, the same applies to all of this other stuff. And well, so, I mean, there was that 60 Minutes thing, but Teslas and all new modern cars are still using 
the old technology, right? Yep. Like it's not. Well, it's not like we've learned. Props to Tesla for at least bringing the cars out, you know, to to some of the conferences mm -hmm. and with, I guess, like cash prizes oh, delivered yeah. on site. It was, I think it was Black Hat last year that it was like, if you can hack this car, you get to take it home. Like, yeah. You know, I, I think that that's, that's the right message to mm -hmm. send. And I mean, talk about a pen test, right? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, and then they patched, I think they patched it in oh, yeah, 24 yeah, hours, yeah. which was uh, Huge. mind blowing. Yeah. I don't. I think you can do that against my, I'm not going to say my, my car. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so I started to become exposed to these problems more and more, uh, through my military service. And I, I realized, you know, just in the course of being curious that, wow, it manifests itself all across the commercial industry. And I wanted to do something about it because I felt, uh, I don't know, just like compelled uh, to protect this equipment because in some cases, literally lives are at stake. Yeah. I mean, if you take control uh, you know, of a significant transportation system, you know, say a train, you know, it's almost like we've regressed back to the mid 1800s, except that you no longer need a horse to like, you know, ride alongside this train, like jump on, like throw the engineer out in order to hijack it. Like you can do it from the comfort of your, your couch. And so we wanted to do something about that before, uh, you know, people were hurt and, and society paid attention. So, uh, you know, here comes shift five and, uh, it essentially, you know, that's what the company was established to do, is to bring products to market that allowed us to secure these legacy protocols that are on everything and will continue to believe, uh, you know, be installed, we believe, uh, on systems for the foreseeable future. We have a lot of legacy uh, infrastructure that uh, is going to run this you know, for the rest of my mm -hmm. life, and so let's do something about it. So that's been my day, night, and weekend for you know, ever since I left the Army. Nice. And you guys are based out of... So right now we're based out of Roslyn. Uh, you know, we bill ourselves as a, a DC area cybersecurity startup. Um, you know, eventually we'll we'll find and settle in a home, but we're growing pretty rapidly right now. So Roslyn, Virginia. Nice. So uh, what do you like doing in your free time? Do you have free time or no? Do you remember what it was like when you had free yeah. time? <laughs> I had free time at one point. So you I, have a pilot's license. I do have a pilot's license. I love to fly. Um, when I was at Fort Benning in infantry school, I, uh, I got a little bored uh, going out and just like drinking every single weekend. I was spending a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Elk, as you do. Yeah. Fort Benning Fridays. The military. Fort Benning. Um, and so what I did is I, uh, I just kind of like calculated out that I was spending like hundreds of dollars a week on, you know, just par like partying. Yeah. And I started to save up the money for a couple of months. And then um, I, I got a book for the written uh, the pilot, mm -hmm. like the written pilot's test. I just sat down, read the entire ground school book, and I walk into this flight school and I tell them, "Hey, listen, I'm going to be the fastest like student pilot you've ever seen." <laughs> and they're laughing at me. They're like, "What are you talking about, kid?" Like, and I'm like, "No, listen, like, give me a practice written right now. I'll take it. I'll pass it. I'll prove it to you." And I did. And they were like, "Okay, sure. Like, uh, let's do this." Here's the trick to getting a pilot's license uh, on a budget. You you make your budget um, at the minimum. FAA hour requirement is 40. Most people do it in around 72 hours. I did it in 42 because I showed up for classes like every single day almost. Jeez. Um, so I would do one or two lessons a day, like every day or every other day. And then I would go home and I had a simulator set up with the yoke and the pedals. <laughs> and then I would redo the lesson at home uh, to, to really make sure I got the muscle memory down, understood the, the sight picture you know, on landing and everything. Um, and so I, I knocked out my pilot's license and, uh, I've, you know, I, I just really like flying. I think that uh, general aviation's kind of taken a nosedive the last couple of years. It's, it's become inaccessible to the common person. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame because it's a, it's a wonderful experience. It's an efficient way to travel. Um, you learn a lot and I think that it, it forces you to, uh, to stay dedicated to a lifetime of learning because you have to constantly be doing some type of training or some type of professional education to be a safe pilot. Um, and it's also just really cool just, you know, telling your friends like, hey, want to go, uh, you know, just do brunch like you know, 400 <laughs> miles from here? Like yeah. it's only like an hour flight. You know, yeah. you can, uh, I, I recall you talking to, uh, to our CEO on your way in about flying about to Ocean City for lunch one day. <laughs> yeah, so like four and a half hour car ride, yeah. right? Uh, but you can make it there from D.C. in about 45 minutes. Nice. Do you have friends that are like refusing to go with you? No. I haven't, <laughs> haven't had that problem yet. That's interesting. I don't know. I guess it would all depend on my friend, which if I would. Yeah, like I know who I'm safe. friends with and uh, I don't like him behind the wheel of a car. So like 
I'm not getting into the air with any of those people. But I mean, I guess an air is easier. It's like as long as he's focused for the the takeoff and landing. I so it's know. funny. I, I think everybody that knows me will, will tell me that I'm terrifying behind the wheel. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just different. You get in a plane, you have a checklist. There's just mm-hmm. a total like, hey, you like prep for it. You know, the, it's a process that you can immerse yourself in. Yeah, and I like it because it it forces me to. Um, the, yeah, exactly. It's like a Zen thing. Like mm-hmm. you, you just get in the motion of it and you do it. And it helps me, frankly, it helps me de-stress and focus. Um, yeah, I think it's also, it's dangerous enough that it makes you kind of take those steps where I think driving a car is kind of numb. Yeah, people, your you, you get too used, used to too it. too used to yeah. it. I don't know if you'll ever get that used to flying because it takes so much prep yeah. to get off the ground. It's Especially actually, around the DC area because mm-hmm. we have this uh, special flight rules area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> DC, Oklahoma. yeah. So here's a little trip uh, trick. If anybody's interested in learning to fly in DC, there are a couple airports. One of them is College Park Airport, right? It's here. the world's continu- yeah. oldest it, continuously operated airport. That's right. The yep. Wright brothers flew out of here. It's actually right out of You can walk there in about three minutes. Yeah. So, you know, after 9 11 with the no fly zone, uh, you know, a lot of. Uh, their their flight volume really decreased. Mm-hmm. You can still fly out of these uh, airports in the DC um, special flight rules area if you go through this process uh, to get fingerprinted and, and certified by the ATC. And um, it requires you to be a little bit more on the ball with uh, air traffic control. Uh, but honestly, uh, you know, hats off. Uh, I think some of the most professional people in government are uh, FAA uh, employees and the air traffic control controllers, and they do an amazing job. You, you just you get the you you get fingerprinted, you you do like a online class, and then you can fly in and out of the region here. And so, uh, you know, a oh, little shout awesome. out. Yeah. Uh, so what's what's on the radar? What's coming up for you the next six months, shift five or otherwise? Yeah. So uh, you know the company is is early stage. We're revenue positive, and so we're trying to grow that. Uh, we're hiring. Uh, we're looking for exceptional, you know, world-class uh, security engineers, software. Uh, we need a couple hardware engineers as well, people with electrical engineering degree, computer engineering degree. Um, you know, we're we're looking for people that uh, really want more than anything to apply their skills uh, in the service of, uh, you know, securing our, our national infrastructure. Uh, I think that this is a, a competitive advantage that we can mm-hmm. offer vice uh you know other companies in the uh, um, in the the tech space. So hiring, uh, I think, really just building out uh, our sales pipeline, um, getting our product integrated onto more aircraft, onto more ships, onto more uh, rail. Um, we're doing uh, obviously a little bit of support for the Department of Defense, but uh, you know the thing that we're really focused on is, se- is securing this commercial infrastructure. Um, I think it's really cool, by the way, uh, this idea of securing off-road equipment. Like, you know, when you were a kid, you probably played with like those Caterpillar Tonka trucks. Yeah. Um, we are sending people out to the field in literally just a couple of days to do data captures on massive real world Tonka trucks and stuff uh, because we think that this is infrastructure that, uh, you know, people, um, well, we know that people want to secure and right. the reason is because people are targeting it. Yeah, it's nuts. I think, well, and I, I just pulled up an article about it because uh, it's really interesting when you look at you know securing these infrastructure systems. It was last year that a water utility in Europe found out that they had uh, Bitcoin miners all over their ICS and SCADA equipment, which I found fascinating for a host of reasons, not least why are those touching the internet to mine coins for someone. But um, I I mean, obviously there's a cross-section of need because these are these are incredibly legacy systems with no real security applied to them. But mm-hmm. is there any one, as you've been working on this, is there any one like system or any one fact you've discovered that has just scared you the most or been the most eye-opening? Yeah, so, you know, uh, broad trends, there's a, big, uh, there's a big push to install telematics systems. Telematics wasn't a term I was familiar with until recently, but essentially, you know, let's say you're, uh, you're operating some infrastructure um, and it's kind of at the intersection of uh, telecommunications network, um, some type of operations or automotive or mobility or whatever. You know, everybody wants to hook everything up so they can get the data. You know, we we see a lot of a push in the automotive industry for companies to reinvent themselves as tech companies, as data companies, and not you know less so like bending metal and actually building and selling cars. As we connect things up, 
uh, to the network, uh, we're making on net access you know easier. Right. Off net access has always been there. I think that that's going to continue to grow as a threat uh, vector. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, supply chain dependencies. Uh, you know, uh, people physically getting access to things or just walking up and um, you know breaking and entering that kind of thing. But the more that we drive to get data uh, through, uh, you know, through the network, the more that we hook things up. You know, so to say, uh, this isn't really IoT, but right. I guess the concept still applies. Um, we're going to see these these threats emerge, and so I've recently come across. Uh, you know some major transportation systems that uh, literally tens of thousands of people rely on uh, just in, in one metropolitan area on a daily basis uh, to move from A to B. You know as they commute, and uh, you know it's unsecured and connected uh, to the internet. Mm-hmm. And when you get access to that telematic system, uh, you know to that modem, then you can reprogram other things. Right. On the data bus, and so when you reprogram an engine control unit for a full authority digital engine control, you know, FADA controller, or you, re, you know, you reprogram a, uh, uh, you know, an ECU that is maybe the bus controller on a primary network, you own that thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, random question: If you could add one thing to our shelves, if you've noticed our shelves in the back, what would it be? Man, you guys got a bunch of stuff covered here. We got uh, a bunch of random stuff, so we're starting out small, and we're trying to. Just expand it until the whole room is just nothing yeah. but kitschy shell. It's good stuff. So, you know, I guess just sticking with the flying theme, maybe like one of those little, uh, you know, like pull back to wind up. You know, a little like. Uh, actually, you know what? No, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little a little crazy. I got my start in this because I really liked autopilots and I really liked autonomy and microcontrollers and stuff. I think you guys need like an old school autopilot, like maybe an Ardu pilot board. Oh. It's totally useless now. I'll, I'll send you guys one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> a box of these old Perfect. Yeah. microcontroller, you know, PCBs uh, from... Nice. Oh, I think that'll, that'll be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, something to counter that ZX81 up there. That is, <laughs> it's nuts. Or our, our ancient floppy drive just sitting on the shelf. I love it. <laughs> Five and a half inch, right? Yeah. yeah. The good stuff. Yeah. Truly floppy. Yeah. Not those, like... Stiff floppy. Well, three, yeah, that's not three floppy. Or whatever. It's firm. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the CDs that were in the three and a half, like floppy? What were they called? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, it was like oh, the like old Mag school. data. It was like the CD ROM drive that was inside a floppy yeah, house. The, the actual mag, mag tape. Um, what the hell was that called? Those were nuts. Oh. I wish we had one of those. Yeah. That would have been sick. So. I, I remember when my dad brought home a, a computer from his engineering company and, and they had installed a CD drive and presented this like. Ancient. It was a 486. Actually, this is not that ancient, but he presented this to me as like a birthday, pre- uh, so a Christmas <laughs> present, and it had a CD drive. And this had just come out. This was like hot tech. Yeah. And I was able to install StarCraft, which didn't run. Nice. It was too slow. <laughs> yeah. But, um, that was. Uh, I think it was my second computer. So there you go. There's the. Yeah. Uh, my second computer was a uh, Gateway 2000 that I got to custom build ish. I guess. Yeah, because those were like the first, that was like the precursor, I think, to Dell or one of the competitors that kind of came out with Dell. You go and it was like a barn themed store. Yeah. It was the weirdest thing, but I got my first one and I think it was one of the first ones with a, a CD ROM drive and that was, that was nuts. When I was in, uh, when I was in high school, my buddy and I got a job over the summer replacing all the school, the library computers. And as we were putting them in, we noticed like, oh, hey, these all still have floppy drives. I wonder if they're enabled. And we checked and like on the boot, and we were the ones doing the IT, so we just left that boot menu option open. So uh, we would boot them up. We had like I think it was six or seven floppy disks that had the most like the lightest weight Linux distribution we could possibly find, and we just use that and just use that to skip past all the school's filters and everything they had implemented. (laughs) Six or seven floppy disks. That sounds like Oregon Trail. Yeah, just about. (laughs) Jeez. Oh, all right. Uh, Anything else you guys want to talk about? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. I just want to say thanks. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. this is great. Um, and then anybody you think we should have on the podcast besides Josh? Yeah, so, you know, uh, somebody that has a really interesting story as well as my co-founder, James Kareni. Um, he had a very different, um, uh, you know, venture. He went into the Signal Corps and did some time in Special Forces doing, uh, you know, comms worldwide yeah. uh, and then went into cyber. So if you want to hear how that painted a, a very different perspective, yeah, that'd be cool. He also helped. He he was like the founding member of the Army's Offensive Capability Development Organization, hmm. which was modeled after 90th COS mm-hmm. and Nickwich. Nice. I think you should. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely. Yeah, I think yeah, be great. we'll drag that out. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, 
Mike, thanks again for coming. Joe, awesome. Happy to be here. All right, guys. Thanks.